So Lene uh, said that she was describing a project that had just started um, relatively recently, and I'm going to describe a project that hasn't started yet at all. Um, but I guess kind of the, the, the prerogative of organizing the, the symposium is I managed to snag a slot so I could talk to you a little bit about a project that we're beginning and to um, encourage your help and participation in, in this project. Um, many of you may know that the, uh, WHO is starting a process of developing health-related rehabilitation guidelines. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that process looks like, um, although uh, because Chapal's here, he probably knows more than I do about the process and, and may be able to fill in some gaps. And then talk about uh, just a small portion that we're engaged in in um, helping uh, to identify and to develop the evidence base that will be used for creating those health-related rehabilitation guidelines. So the WHO is, is goal in beginning this process really is, this is three parts at least. There are probably other, other parts to the goal. Um, but first of all is to support the implementation of rehabilitation aspects of the CRPD. And uh, in particular Article 26 which requires state parties to take effective and appropriate measures to enable persons with disabilities to attain and maintain maximum independence, full physical, mental, social, and vocational ability, and full inclusion and participation in all aspects of life. Um, it also calls for state parties to organize, strengthen, and extend comprehensive habilitation and rehabilitation services and programs. And so the guidelines are intended to support Article 20, uh, to, to support the implementation of Article 26. Um, the guidelines are also there to provide guidance to governments and other actors and to provide decision makers with evidence informed recommendations um, in particular on how to develop, expand, and improve the quality of rehabilitation services in less resource settings. And it's interesting that that, that term, less resource settings, is defined as a geographical area with limited financial, human, and infrastructural resources. Um, and they note a common situation in low and middle income countries, but also in certain areas of high income countries. Um, and so it'll be very interesting, I think, to, to think about it not as something that's uh, country specific, but really about um, areas within countries, and certainly the United States has uh, many areas that uh, will fit, would fit into that um, definition of um, a, a less resource setting. So let me tell you a little bit about the guideline development approach. Um, this is what I know about it. Um, I have a feeling there are probably more layers to it than what I'm going to present to you, but I think this is the, the overall kind of approach that, that um, WHO will be taking. Um, they have developed a guideline development group um, that was formed and those individuals met in November of 2012. Um, you can see who they are online. I, I think that's up to date. I don't know if anybody has been added or, or dropped out of that. Um, and the guideline development group is uh, comprised of external uh, experts, external to WHO, who will assist with defining the scope of the guidelines, prioritizing research questions, evaluating and interpreting the evidence, and formulating recommendations. And so the guideline development group is a group who will take it from point A to point B all the way through. So the first thing that they did is that they um, developed uh, RFAs, uh, requests for applications, um, in order to support evidence reviews. So um, not necessarily systematic reviews of evidence, although in some cases they did ask that um, people who were awarded those, um, those contracts use systematic review processes. But I'll talk a little bit more about why they didn't require that everybody do that. The proposals were due January 2013. They were awarded in April. Contracts are being worked on as we speak. And, uh, and the University of Washington was successful in, in, um, in, in receiving a couple of those contracts, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So then once the reviews are completed, the um, GDG, the Guideline Development Group, is going to meet again to assess evidence and formulate draft recommendations. Um, they will be peer reviewed by an external group outside of the guidelines development group. Um, once those are finalized, they go through an approval process with WHO and back to the GDG, and then they get published and launched. And the goal is completion near the end of 2014. So 
I think they're shooting for November, but they may be a little bit behind at this point, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and I think what's interesting about this uh, approach is that the really explicit focus on um, attempting to base the guidelines on evidence as much as possible. Um, and they use a term, which I'm going to forget. It's not evidence-based, it's um, evidence-guided, or that's not quite right. It'll come back to me. Uh, so they're not saying that, that all the guidelines will be based on evidence because there simply isn't evidence for everything that needs to be um, in a guideline. Um, and so some of it will have to be based on professional judgment and what we believe is best practice because we don't have research to support it. But to the extent possible, these guidelines will be based on evidence. And so um, what they did is they released uh, a request for applications for seven work packages. And those packages are, are uh, 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 they want somebody to really write about the background for rehabilitation and, and what we know about why it's important and why we need it. They want somebody to, to um, look and see what evidence is available around leadership and governance um, in terms of support of rehabilitation services. They want somebody to look at service delivery itself, what is effective service delivery. And, and I think that they're looking at you know, many of the things we've talked about here, which how do we de-skill and sort of expand out the, um, the, the array of health professionals who could provide rehabilitation services. Um, but they want to see what kind of evidence is around um, around service delivery in, in less resource settings. There's a workforce, a work package on rehabil the rehabilitation workforce, uh, another one on assistive technology, one on financing, and one on information systems. And so, uh, University of Washington was successful in receiving the the the, um, the contracts for service delivery and assistive technology. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about what we're going to be doing to identify the evidence um, and, and it, the, the evidence that is available in those two areas and then provide that back to the guideline development group. Uh, I, I want to mention first though that we wrote our um, proposals with a research team that included uh, Tuna Oderud out of uh, Sintef, which is in Norway, and Arne Eide as well as with Johan Borg, who's in Sweden and currently with Abilia, and Anthony Dettin, who's here and with Handicap International, Handicap International. Um, let me, so our approach is, goes this way. We're going to start with the scoping review, and I'll talk about each of these. Uh, that scoping review will then be um, uh, evaluated by an expert review panel. Um, and then once we have completed that and we feel that we've gathered all the um, all the publications that are relevant and we have a sense for um, what is contained in those publications, we'll move into to a, a mixed studies review where we'll really look more in depth at um, the empirical evidence that's available. So the scoping review, I don't know if you all are familiar with that terminology, but it's, it's, an, it's a review, often an initial review that's carried out just to develop an understanding of what the research landscape looks like. So, um, you know, do we have any publications to deal with rehabilitation services in a certain way or not? So what's the extent, what's the range, and what's the nature of existing evidence? And these are intended to get an overview of key themes that are um, in the research. They are always um, focused on comprehensive coverage. So, so we won't limit the types of research. Um, we'll just try to get everything available in the area of assistive technology and the area of, of rehabilitation services. Um, and often these reviews are done just through the abstracts of the article. So we don't even read the whole article. We just are, are looking through the abstract, pulling out the topic areas, um, identifying who the samples are and those kinds of things. If that can be done from the abstract, um, then, then it's done from the abstract. Otherwise, we may dig into the, the article or the manuscript. And then at this point, we don't engage in grading the assess or assessing the quality of the evidence. So it's not about was this good research or is it weaker research. It's just what, what is there available. And the idea then is once you have that big picture, then you can say, okay, well, we don't have any evidence about X, but we have a lot of evidence about Y. We, can, we actually can do a review in that area. So once we do the scoping review, and it, this is going to be more interactive than it sounds like, but once we do the scoping review, then we have the expert panel review those findings, um, help us identify missing sources of evidence because um, it's going to be a challenge to make sure we capture everything. 
um, we'll get feedback on the findings from them and they will help us um, develop the next review that we will do. Um, the expert panel that is currently in place is uh, the individuals you see on the board, um, but we will be uh, seeking additional members of the expert panel and in fact Anthony is on the grant in particular because of the connections he has through uh, HI to help us begin to connect with people um, who we don't currently have um, uh, working relationships with. So once we have, uh, have worked with the expert review panel, we'll move into the mixed studies review. This is really an approach that supports the use of um, a range of types of research, including um, quantitative research, qualitative, and mixed methods re research um, in a single uh, evidence review. And um, there are a number of ways to, to do a analysis in a review like this. I'm not sure where we're going to end up going. Um, there's an article by Pluye, I don't know if I say it right, P-L-U-Y-E, who talks about, um, you know, you can approach synthesis by looking at what he calls an assimilation stance where you attempt to merge the findings by kind of quantifying the qualitative findings and qualifying the quantitative findings and pooling them together. Um, you can also use uh, what's called a complementarity stance where you treat the two different types of findings separately and then you identify ways in which the two support or diverge from each other. Or you can use a divergent stance in, in which you look for discrepancies between the two types of findings. But we're, we're going to attempt to do something that includes both qualitative and quantitative research in a, a, a fairly rigorous review. And it's not something that's done a lot but we feel it's pretty important because uh, what we think is going to be true is that when we start really digging for evidence that we're not going to find big clinical trials that have been conducted. We're not going to find this what kind of gold standard of evidence in all of the questions we're interested in. We're going to find a wide range of types of research and a wide range of quality and we're going to need to think about what can we say about what we know based on, uh, on this divergent evidence. So um, for both the, the scope and review and the, the mixed studies review, we'll go through a process that looks something like this. We create a development plan where we identify what the questions are, how we're going to conduct the literature search, what sources we're going to use, those kinds of things. We then conduct the literature search and we do, once, we, once we've done that, and that's, that's not so straightforward, obviously, that's like kind of a, we run searches and then we'll have to continue to hunt. Um, we're going to be, uh, as much as possible, trying to seek r literature from the gray literature, so the non-published literature, so I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's where you guys come in. Um, and then once we have literature, we extract data. That just means that we go through an article or a manuscript and we pull out um, information about the sample, the setting, you know, the statistics about the study. And we pull those into tables of evidence. Um, which are more easily reviewed where we can actually compare um, studies. So we'll develop and review tables of evidence um, and, and conduct some form of analysis. In some cases we may, for the quantitative research, we may engage in a, a grading process. Um, we will be using the, the overall grade approach, which now I'm going to blank on what the ac that acronym stands for, but um, we may or may not be grading evidence all the way, if that makes sense. Well then, uh, we'll, the expert panel will review and then we engage in synthesis and reporting. Um, and we'll be writing technical reports, but WHO will also require that we um, develop evidence briefs, which are short, up to four pages, that really summarize in user-friendly language what we have learned from the, conducting the reviews. Just a few challenges to, that you all are probably aware of, and I've touched on this already. You know, what uh, any kind of review is, is limited or strengthened by the type of types of evidence that are available in a field. And in rehabilitation, um, we, we often find that there are few, if any, high qual quality studies. Um, we've, we've been conducting systematic reviews for a while, first with our Model System Knowledge Translation Center, and we're doing a little bit of a different kind of review in our ADA Knowledge Translation Center. Um, and it, it's just true that there aren't as many um, studies that fit into what are categories as categorized as high quality, meaning clinical trial studies that have randomization and so forth. So in rehab, we don't have many of those, and we don't have those for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to 
randomize people into rehabilitation interventions and so forth, and, some, and there are ethical concerns about doing that. So the available studies are often of less quality than we expected or we would hope. They have smaller sample sizes, weaker research designs, and that will require us, as I mentioned before, to really gather widely and to include a wider range of evidence. So given all that, we really, really could use your help. Um, and we're going to be setting up a strategy for trying to engage this group here as well as uh, others who have expressed interest in this area. And that is in, in, in identifying the gray literature that is, is out there in the field. So we think there's a lot of evidence hidden away in technical reports that have been um, written and developed by NGOs um, and governmental organizations that never, never was published in a journal or some other kind of formal academic setting. So we're going to be looking for technical reports, dissertations or theses, conference proceedings, and I'm sure all of you have your, you know, fingers in different areas um, that are related to disability technology and rehabilitation, and we could use all of your help to help us find those, um, those hidden pieces of information. And um, the other area where we could use help is uh, identification of important research that's not reported in English. We're going to attempt to do searching in a number of different languages, and we have a, a tiny amount of translator dollars, um, translation dollars. Um, we may try to work with um, a group, we, we don't have a formal agreement, but there is a group that does trans, called Translation Across Borders, where there are volunteers who will help with these kinds of things. So, um, but, it, but we could use help identifying important research that's not in English. And what we'll be doing is setting up what we're sort of calling a crowdsourcing mechanism. We haven't completely figured out how we're going to do it, but something on our website where you can submit uh, a paper or, or, um, or an idea, and um, then that will be listed on the website so that people can see that it's been submitted, um, and uh, we'll gather as much evidence as we can in that way. So that's it. Thank you so much.